Right. So when you think about the Shema, there are, of course, the Shema captures the principle, the most important principle of Judaism. Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Another thing to think about the Shema is that it's not sort of an abstract belief system. It's that too, but it doesn't stop there. If you think about it, Shema begins in your mind. It begins with a meditation. God is one. It's the acceptance in the mind. And then, sort of belief, and then it spreads to the rest of the body and further outward, right? So Shema, very small paragraph, but listen, hero Israel, meaning listen, listen is understand the unity of Hashem. Then it goes, I love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. So that is your emotions. And then, so heart, mind, I'm sorry, mind, heart. And then from your heart, it's supposed to spread to the rest of your body. And that's why it talks, it talks about speak the words of the Torah. That's speech. And then you have action. Um, lay to fill in. That's action. Right? So you're starting out with your mind, going to the heart, going to speech, going to action. And finally, talking about the mezuzah. What's the mezuzah? Putting, inscribing the oneness of Hashem on your door. Your door is not only to say that my home is holy. It's that too. But the Torah emphasizes your door and your gates. And if you think about a door, a door works both ways. A door means you're sort of closing off this environment from the rest of the world. But a door is also the way you pass from your protected environment to the rest of the world. Right? So in other words, the door, what you put out your door is the inspiration that you carry with you when you go outward. So I think it's a, a sort of an in interesting visual of saying the Shema, heart, mind, speech, action, influence the rest of the world. So Shema is sort of comprehensive. Okay, now, when we talk about the Shema, one verse of the Shema is, okay, um, these words which I command you today, should be upon your heart, teach them thoroughly to your children, and speak them when you sit in your home, and when you go on the road, when you lie down, and when you wake up. Okay, so what are the words we're talking about? And these words which I command you today, what are we talking about? And teach them to the children and say them when you're in your house, when you're on the road, when you lie down, when you, when you wake up. So they're really talking about two separate things. They're not separate, but two things. This verse is the actual source for the mitzvah of study Torah. You open up Maimonides and you look at the laws of Talmud Torah, the laws of studying Torah. How do you know that you have to study Torah? Because it says... Teach them to your children, and speak them. You have to speak the words of Torah. Teach it and speak it. It's an interesting question of why um, Maimonides begins with the mitzvah to teach to your children as opposed to learn for yourself. It's That's a separate discussion. Uh, a beautiful concept that when you learn, you have to, you have to learn like a child. Because children learn, they're open. They don't come with preconceived notions. They don't come and they don't say, well, this is my perspective. Let me see if that makes sense to me. When children open it, uh, learn, and that's why they remember, it's because they're open and they're um, accepting. And then after you learn like a child, then you could analyze as an adult. But the idea, the premise is learn like a child. But putting that issue aside, this verse, th th these words that which I command you today is the, is the source of the mitzvah to learn Torah. Okay, one mitzvah. Now, is these that same verse is also the source of the mitzvah to say the Shema. We'll get to that in a second. Go ahead, Vicky, please. Oh, maybe I was confusing and looking at the wrong page because it does say it's not, not the words, all these matters. That so that's very interesting. In, in Hebrew, the word oh. dabar, it's very interesting. We're going off topic, but okay. It's always fun to go off topic. The more off topic we go, the funner it is. The word davar in Hebrew is a very interesting word. Because remember, the, we, we pronounce it davar, dvarim. We're in the book of dvarim. We're in the book of Deuteronomy, words. The word davar, dvarim, is words. But the reason why they write matters is because in Hebrew, davar can also be a thing, meaning a physical thing, material, matter. And so... The typical, the, the typical translation, these are the words that Moses spoke. We're not going to say these are the matters that Moses spoke. Maybe yes, but it's the simple meaning of the is words. So in the Shema, 
These words, now these matters, I guess, I wouldn't even say matters. I would say, they say matters is sort of an in-between word. But in Hebrew, it's either these matters or these things. Now, you're not going to say things about ideas. But it's just interesting that we study this in Tanya, that according to the Kabbalah, every, what creates every matter, what creates every, every, every material object has to have the word of God within it, giving it life, bringing it into existence, ex nihilo, something from nothing. So now there's a relationship between words and things because everything is an embodiment of the word of God. And that's why in biblical Hebrew, the same word for word is the same word for word and for thing, right? Yeah, but doesn't it doesn't it mean that um, in Moshe's mind it's not only words, but you have to apply it to your yes. life? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Your children not only the words, but how to live your life. Based correct, on correct, correct. But 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 it's also it's also the idea. That's why when you study Torah, there's a mitzvah to actually articulate the words. So. When you go to yeshiva, everyone's screaming, everyone's talking, you have to articulate it because, and by the way, according to the halacha, if you're listening to someone articulating, it's just like you're articulating, right? So, 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 shomea ke'one, like you don't have to blow the shofar, you could hear someone who blows the shofar. Listener is like speaker, but it means that the practical, the words of Torah don't remain in the, in the, in the brain, but they're actually making a physical and tangible effect on earth. And that's why when you're studying Torah alone, traditionally, you're supposed to move your, you're supposed to move your lips you're supposed to you're supposed to you're supposed to make make some movement with the mouth because you want it you want it to be these words my point is that devarim is words maybe it also means matters maybe it also means things but it's words you have to speak the words of torah um <clears throat> these words are also the the source of the commandment the same verse is also the source of the commandment to say the shema so let me just open it up quickly so we know what we're talking about. I mean, we know what we're talking about, but it's always good to take a, take a look. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the Shema, the sixth reading of this week's Parsha. <clears throat> And these words you see on the, here in the um, I don't know what the what the Siddur translates, but this Mitzvah translates verse six. And these words, these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. Teach them to your sons and speak to them and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Okay, um, the sages derive in the Mishnah, first chapter of the Mishnah of, of, of the Mishnah of all the Mishnah, the Mishnah of Tractate Brachot. That we're talking also, these words applies to the Torah in general, and there's a mitzvah to study Torah, but we're also talking about these words. Which words? These words, verse 4, 5, 6, 7, the words of the Shema. And then you should say it, speak of them when you lie down and when you rise up. And this gives us two of the 613 commandments, which is say the Shema. But there's two separate commandments. commandments. There's a mitzvah to read the Shema in the morning, when you, uh, and let's start with the night. There's a mitzvah to say the Shema at night when you lie down, and the mitzvah to say the Shema in the morning when you rise up. So with these words, verse six and seven, have two mitzvot, two very important mitzvot: Torah study and recitation of the Shema. Which recitation of the Shema? What is Shema? Shema is part of um. What it, what 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 is Shema? Shema is part of the. Torah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so now the question is, what is the difference between the Shema and the Torah? In other words, like this. There's a mitzvah to say the Shema, Shema twice a day. There's no mitzvah to study Torah twice a day. The mitzvah is ongoing mitzvah. Study Torah. When do you study Torah? Always. What does always mean? Always means it depends when you have free time. Some people are very busy. They're working in the farm. They have to plant potatoes. They have less time. So the Talmud says if you have so little time, actually just saying the Shema itself is already enough. You fulfilled your obligation to study Torah day and night. Because you study Torah, you fill up all your free time. So st st study Torah is always, you always study Torah. So we'll take the question in a moment. But the point here is, why is it, why is this formulation that when it comes to the Shema, 
we have two separate mitzvot. And when it comes to the Torah, there's one ongoing mitzvah. And as it may seem like a technical question, but once we get to the answer, we'll see that it's not a technical question. This actually gets to the heart of what the Shema is trying to do, what the Torah is trying to do. It's actually trying to do two different things. And that's why in the halachic ramifications of the mitzvah or the halachic definitions of this mitzvah, there's a difference between the Shema, where there's a mitzvah to say, Twice a day, meaning there's two mitzvot, morning, night, whereas Torah study is one mitzvah, ongoing. You say the Shema, you learn Torah always. When do you learn Torah? Always. How many minutes a day? Well, sometimes five minutes, sometimes ten, sometimes an hour. doesn't matter. But the obligation is always. Go ahead, Dr. Tamarin, please. Question. The Shema is a declaration, correct? It's something we need to say. It's not correct. something we need to think. Okay. Correct. Well, well, right. Well, Shema is interesting. Um Usually, when you talk about the words of prayer, the most important thing is the recitation and the intention is secondary. And that's consistent with Judaism where, um, where the action and the tangible is more pressing than the abstract and the idea. However, there's an exception, and that is the first sentence of the Shema. The first sentence of the Shema, we're supposed to in other words, the you have to you have to understand what you're saying and you have to pay attention. And if I didn't pay attention, I have to repeat the first sentence. If I prayed 40 pages of the, the prayer book in the morning and I was thinking about the stock market, that's fine. I don't have to repeat it. But the first sentence of the Shema, if I read the first sentence of the Shema and I'm talking thinking about um, the boat that's leaving uh, to, 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 to Greenwich Beach at 12 o'clock, I have to repeat it because, it because that's the one mitzvah where Shema means listen. Listen means pay attention. So that's it. It is it is a declaration, but it's also uh, uh, it's supposed to be a meditation as well. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not only a meditation because because it's actually what the Shema is basically saying is, "Hero Israel, listen, pay attention." But right after that, if you look at the, um, I'm going to share the screen once more. If you look at the, at what the Shema is doing, it's jumping straight from the mind in verse four. Verse five is to the heart. You shall love the Lord your God. So it's going from the mind to the heart. From the heart, it's going to the mouth. Speak the words of Torah. That's verse six and seven. Verse six and seven, and then it's going to action. Lay the tefillin, which represents action, and then verse nine, which is inscribe them upon your doorposts, means put it on your door. Let it fill your home, but not just your home. When you leave your home, you're carrying the message of the Shema to the rest of the world. So think of the Shema as beginning in the head going to the heart, spreading to my whole body, spreading to my whole house, and ultimately spreading to the whole world. But also, just let me clarify something. The Shema is an acknowledgement of our, in a way, connection to and dependence on God, is it not? Yes. Well, then, then let me ask you something. Isn't a isn't the Shema a declaration of the de of dependence? Um, I think you 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 probably could call it that way. Um, I'm just trying to think if that if that would capture it entirely. It's in a way, yes. I it may be a little bit more because when it's of Hashem, in a way. Yeah, yeah. I don't dependence. Dependent. What do you mean by dependence? Well, that 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 my whole being depends yes, on that yes, connection. Yes. The answer is yes, yes. And then the answer is yes. So I was just amused because I was thinking about our declaration of independence <laughs> as juxtaposed against the Shema, which is a declaration of dependence. Yeah, we're definitely not independent. We like to think of ourselves as independent. We're independent beings, but we are not independent. We're independent no. from the British crown, that yes. That we have independence. We're independent from the British crown, but we're not independent from the source of our life. Correct. Oh, but you see, what I'm saying is that in many ways, this is very profound because what it suggests is as the 23rd Psalm, we're never alone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If God is one, and we're going to talk about what God what was one, what that really means. And we talked about it in the past when we studied the Tanya. God is one means that God permeates everything. So that's why when you look around the world, you see the multiplicity. It's not really multiplicity. It's just various expressions of the same oneness. So ultimately, God is always with you because there's no space outside the oneness. So I think dependence is um, is correct. Um, okay, so let's think about this for a moment. And I'm, I'll try to give the big idea. 
And then I try, I try to give the big idea and then we'll try to read it inside. Um, you know what? Let's read the questions. We'll, re we'll read the questions just a little bit to, just, to get a, just to get a taste. We'll read three, four minutes of questions of the question. And then maybe we'll give a little introduction to the answer. Then we give an answer and then we'll do the treat, which is seeing this in the Mishnah. So that's the roadmap. Okay, so I'm just going to read. This is an essay of the Rebbe. This was um, the Rebbe's book, this in the 60s, 19th of Kislev. Okay, two fundamental mitzvot are explained in our parsha: the mitzvah of reciting the Shema and the mitzvah of studying Torah. Both are based on a single verse. Halacha establishes that reciting Shema in the morning in the, and in the evening fulfills the obligation to toiling in Torah day and night. And conversely, the mitzvah of studying the written Torah is fulfilled by recitation similar to reciting Shema. Nevertheless, there is a significant difference between them. The mitzvah of reciting the Shema applies twice daily, morning and evening, as the Torah states in our parsha, when you lie down and when you arise. Each recitation is independent of the other, as evident by the recitation of the blessing of the Shema twice daily, in the morning and in the evening. On the other hand, the obligation to Torah study is not divided into two distinct obligations during the day and during the night. Rather, there is a single ongoing obligation at all hours of the day and night. Therefore, the Torah blessings are recited only once daily, even by someone who studies Torah, who studies only intermittent, intermittently, since Torah study is a single continuous obligation without interruption. What the Rebbe is saying is as follows. When we say the Shema, even though the biblical commandment is to say the Shema, but the rabbis add blessings. And the blessings before the Shema make the prayer a little bit longer. There's two blessings before the Shema, one blessing after the Shema. In the morning, at night, there's two blessings before the Shema, two blessings after the Shema. So we see here that each Shema has separate blessings, which means each Shema is a separate mitzvah. Whereas when it comes to Torah study, you say the blessing to study Torah. There is a blessing Torah. We thank God for giving us the, bless, the the commandment to study Torah. But you say it every day, once a day in the morning, regardless if you study once that day, 10 times that day, or the entire day straight. It doesn't really matter because it doesn't really matter how many times you study Torah throughout the day, but the obligation is one and it's continuous. Whereas the obligation to say the Shema is twice and each one is a separate commandment. So now it's interesting that the same words we get two mitzvot, and these mitzvot are so different in this important way, which is, is it ongoing or is it two separate times? So we need to clarify. Seemingly, based on the underlying ideas of these mitzvot, the exact opposite will be more reasonable. Torah studies associated with understanding and comprehension, since the mitzvah obligates a person to understand the subject being studied. If a person does not understand what he reads in the oral Torah, he does not fulfill the mitzvah of Torah study and does not recite a blessing. Since understanding and comprehension can vary and not at all time periods are the same, it is reasonable for the mitzvah of Torah study to be bound to time and, and to divisions of time. I'm going to skip the next paragraph. Um, whereas, in contrast, the mitzvah of Shema serves as a constant reminder of every Jew to submit to Hashem's sovereignty and unity, or in the language of Dr. Tamarin, to declare our dependence on Hashem. Since remembering Hashem's sovereignty and unity is, is a constant mitzvah, there is no reason to differentiate and, and, and division to, for, for differences and divisions based on the changes of day and night. So this is a profound question. In other words, when you talk about the mitzvahs to understand, so I ask you a question, could you understand the same thing? Could you understand the same way at every time? No, sometimes you're, 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 you're tired. Sometimes you're more tired. Sometimes you're less tired. Sometimes you are. Sometimes you are. Um, open to understanding, sometimes you're distracted. So when it comes to understanding, there are differences within the person. So I would expect that the mitzvah of learning Torah should accommodate for these differences, not one ongoing mitzvah. Whereas when it comes to the recitation of the Shema, what is the Shema saying? The Shema is saying there's the unity of Hashem. The unity of Hashem, the unity of Hashem is a constant mitzvah. You always have to believe in God. You know, we don't believe in God only from 5 to 6 p.m., you believe in God constantly. So if you believe in God, in God constantly, why isn't it a constant mitzvah? Why is it a mitzvah that appears twice? Um, why is it a mitzvah that has specifically twice a day, morning and evening?
So that's the question. And of course, the question is only an invitation to get to a deeper understanding of what is the purpose of the Shema, what is the purpose of the Torah, and the fact that they're in the same, they're in the same, they're in the same, they, they're derived from the same verse means it's an invitation to think about how they in interact with each other and how they inform each other. So all this is by way of sort of leading us in to get to the to get to get to the deeper dimension. So I'm going to say the point in short, and then, then we'll read it inside because I'm not sure I can explain. I'm not, we'll see. We'll see how good I can explain it. What is the Shema? The Shema, the, the idea of the Shema is to declare the unity of Hashem. But the idea is to say that everything we see in our world, the world itself is not separate from the oneness of God. Rather, it's an expression of the oneness of God. That is the purpose of the Shema. The purpose of the Shema is to bring the unity of Hashem into the world. Um, there's a meditation that the Talmud talks about. When the Talmud says, when you say Hashem Echad, God is one. So the Talmud says you have to meditate. And you have to, if you meditate for the longer, the better. That's the first statement to the Talmud. Anyone who meditates at length in the word Echad, God will lengthen your years. So that's the secret to long life. And then the Talmud would say, you just say, well, you have to lengthen, but not that long. So how long do you have to meditate? So the Talmud says, if you make Hashem the king in the seven heavens on earth and the four directions, you meditated enough. In other words, what they're saying is, and Rashi explains that the word echad, the word one, has three letters, Aleph, Chet, Dalit. Aleph is the numerical value of one. It's the first letter of the alphabet, the numerical value of one. So Aleph represents the oneness of Hashem. Chet is number eight. It's the eighth letter of the alphabet, has the numerical value of eight, and that represents the seven heavens and earth. If you ask me what the seven heavens are, I don't know. In the Talmud, there are seven heavens. They each have names, seven dimensions of spirituality, but it's above. And then there's the earth. So Chet is above and below. And then Dalit is four. So that re represents the four directions, the four, the four directions. So in other words, we're basically saying, we say the Shema, we say that Hashem, the oneness of Hashem is present all, all directions, above, below, east, west, north, and south. And all that is included in the oneness, in the unity. By the way, which explain, this explains why, why we don't say Hashem is the single one. Because the word single negates anything else. The word one, if you say God is the, is the only single thing that exists, that would negate the universe. But there is a universe. So we don't say God is the single thing that exists. We say God is the one thing that exists. And the idea is that the world is not secondary. It's not a second thing because it's part of God's oneness. It's an expression of God's oneness. It's not independent of God's oneness. But to do that, you need to incorporate the world itself, the universe itself. You have to acknowledge that the whole purpose is to say not that God exists, but that God exists within the universe, that the universe is not independent, that the, that the universe is dependent on Hashem. So God is one in the dimensions of the universe. And that's and that's the echad. Okay, fine. That's, that's Shema. If that's the case, we understand why we're going to say the Shema twice a day, morning and evening. Morning and evening represents the changes within the universe. And it could be on many different levels. It could be the reality, the natural world is different day and night. You see the change. But it could also be within the person himself. That's before that. We could talk about the positive experiences in the universe and the negative experiences in the universe. That's night and day. The oneness of Hashem, we declare that God is one, that God is present, and that God, nothing is outside of God, both when we have spiritual darkness and spiritual light, both when the presence of God is obvious and when the presence of God is concealed. So that's night and day in the universe. There's also night and day within myself when I am inspired, when I am enlightened. That's day. When I am, when I when I feel disconnected, when I feel in pain, when I feel separation, that's my spiritual night. 
And the whole idea of the Shema is to incorporate every aspect of the universe and every aspect of my life within the oneness of Hashem. And therefore, we do um, acknowledge the differences, different states within the world. We can't acknowledge every difference, but the main difference is morning and night is what we acknowledge. And we say, we're going to say the Shema both at night and in the morning to, 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 to highlight that even these extreme differences that we have in our life, all of them are incorporated within the oneness of Hashem. So we'll take the doctor's question, we'll elaborate, hopefully explain, and then we're going to contrast that to the Torah and say what the Torah is trying to do is something that is different. And each are important. Go ahead, Dr. Tamron, please. Rabbi, if the purpose of saying the Shema is incorporation, then my question is this. Why do we say God is the king? Why don't we say God is my king? So what we say is, the first thing we say, Hashem Elokeinu, God is our king. So it is making it personal. It's also collective, because it's not just me, but it's Elokeinu, our God. And then we're saying, our God, the problem with personal means that it's only me, or it's provincial, or it's just us. We, God is our God. And we say, our God is the one God. Our God incorporates all of the universe. So we're doing both these two steps. First, we say, identify, we have a relationship with him. But doesn't mean uh, to us, it, it, that's not at the expense. It's not that we're saying it's us and not anybody else. We say it's our God. But this our God is our God, but is the God of the only existence, meaning he incorporates everybody, those who recognize him, those who don't. And he also incorporates every creation, the entire universe, the, all the dimensions. Above, below, the six dimensions, because it, it's 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 universal, all that the entire universe is incorporated within the oneness. And that's the whole point. And therefore, you have to acknowledge the differences between within the universe. You can't say the differences don't matter. The whole idea is I believe in God in the good times and in the bad times. I believe in God when I sense his presence and when I don't. That's the idea of the Shema. So I have to differentiate between those extreme times, night and day. Physical night and day, literal night and day, but also emotional and spiritual night and day as well. And that's the whole purpose of the Shema. And that's why it's divided to night and day, two separate mitzvot. Torah is different, as we'll explain. Go ahead, Dr. Bob. Just a, a small clarification, Rabbi. Is I mean, this is a six-word declaration, two words of which is Adonai, and here we are talking about the oneness of God. Is is the specific repetition of Adonai to reflect this kind of day and night, twice yeah, a day exactly. kind of thing? So I, I would say it a little bit different. We have two names of Hashem. We say Adonai, but that's not what it really says. What it really says is Hashem. Yud Kei Vav Kei, the, 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 the four-letter word that we don't pronounce. Hashem's, Hashem's essential name. We say Hashem Elokeinu. Now, Hashem Elokeinu, according to the Kabbalah, the name Hashem is compassion. The name Elokim is judgment. That's, I'm sorry, that's not the Kabbalah. That's Medrash. That's what Rashi says. In, what it means in Kabbalah is compassion means revelation, and Elokim means concealment. So in other words, Elokim is the name of nature, the name that creates nature, the aspect of Hashem that's concealed within nature, because nature is also a miracle. But it's a miracle that where Hashem's presence is hidden within the laws of nature, because since they're consistent, so it's consistent. So you don't see the presence of God. You don't see the awesomeness of it. Splitting of a sea, a one-time event, ah, you see that's a miracle. So what, what we're saying is Hashem Elohim. Elohim is the power to conceal. I'm sorry, Elohim. Elokeinu. But the Elokeinu is the word Elohim. Elohim is the power to conceal. And Hashem is the power to reveal. Both the power of concealment and the power of, of revelation, in the language of the Kabbalah, both the tzimtzum and the light, light is revelation, and tzimtzum is contraction to conceal the light, which allows us to feel independent, because like the doctor said, we are not independent, it's a big joke, we're not independent, but we feel independent, we feel independent of God, and that's critical, that's why we have free choice. If we understood that every time we separate from Hashem, it's like depriving ourselves of oxygen, which spiritually that's exactly what it is, we would not have free choice. So built into the system is the name Elohim. And the Kabbalah would call it simtsum, concealment, where the presence of God is not felt. 
And that's not just, that's not a bug. That's a feature. That's exactly why God created the world. So this should be a space where people feel independent. And none of the spiritual worlds feel independent. In fact, the definition of, one definition of spirituality is that you sense your source. You sense that you're not independent. The physical world, we feel independent. So that's Elohim. But we're saying both Elohim and Hashem. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Both the Hashem and the Elokeinu are really, both the concealment and the revelation are really an expression of the revelation, are really expression of the oneness of Hashem. Because even the power to conceal is expressing his great might. Because as we said in the Tanya, in the second section, chapter four, in a way to create and hold back, to, to, express, to be present and concealed is a greater feat than just to be present. So you're right. The answer, short answer is you're right. Then two names that appear in the first sentence of the Shema is the same idea. These two names, which create ultimately the differences between night and day, are all one. So what I would say is the first sentence of the Shema incorporates the source of night and day, Elohim and Hashem. And then this, and, and, and then further down in, in the Shema, I forgot what verse it is, five or six, when it says when you lie down and when you wake up, that's an expression of night and day. That's an expression of those two ideas, the way they appeared in the first sentence. So thank you for that. Because yes, in this first sentence itself, we have this dichotomy and then the unity of the dichotomy. So the first half of the phrases is a dichotomy. Here is Hashem Elokeinu. Hashem, name of revelation, Elokeinu, name of concealment. And then we say Hashem Echad, but all of it is one. Even though we don't necessarily see it that way, but that's what we believe. Terrific. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Go ahead, Dr. Tamarin. Rabbi, if we perceive, if, if we're taught, that one of the greatest powers of God is the ability to hold back. Yes. Is it also taught that one of the greatest powers of a human being is the ability to hold back? I would say it's one of the greatest. I would say, I would say now, I would say the most important I'd say the most important powers in a relationship, especially because remember, the, the, when you talk about dependence, dependence is not a good word for a relationship, but because because they have dependency issues. But the reality is that we have a relationship with God and our, our human relationships model that relationship with Hashem. And a relationship, especially when people are in love, it's all about expression. And I want to express and I want to reveal and I want to share with what I'm saying and I'm so excited. So I want to talk. The most, in some ways, the more important ingredient of a, of a, of a I don't want to say more important, they're both important, but in some ways, the, 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 the aspect of the relationship that is easier to ignore is holding back. And holding back would be, would mean different things. It would, it would, some people would call it listening. The Torah would call it awe, but awe is a scary word. So we'll use it, we'll, we'll tell you the word that the Torah really means, which is respect. And respect means, I respect I respect your position, even though it's different than mine. So I'm stopping my perspective, giving room to your perspective. And there could be no relationship without with that without without both those wings. We talked about this in the Kabbalah, and we talked about the Tanya. That is the metaphor of the Zohar that a bird needs two wings to fly. That's love and respect, love and awe. And another way of saying love and awe would be um, would be would be would be um, revelation and and concealment expressing and holding back because love is expressing myself. Um, respect is holding back. I respect your position. That would mean that I have to hold back mine because I want the couch to be here. You want the couch to be there. Okay. So I'm going to say, you know what? I respect your decision. Me, I wouldn't do it this way. That's sort of holding back my perspective and giving room for your perspective. And um, the couch is the easy one, but there's some even more difficult choices. But even the ability to, to acknowledge that you're different. And because I right now feel this way, therefore you have to feel this way right now because you love me. And if you love me, then if I'm happy, you're happy. And if I'm sad, you're sad. No, that's not the way it works. Because love means we want to be one, but awe means we respect that we're different. And, and, and we have to take those differences into account. So yes, this is the exact same uh, ingredients are critical for human relationships. Go ahead, Dr. Tamron, please. You gave us a beautiful example of this yesterday when you described your experience of going to three different yeshivas and your mother's response. Right. So, so the ability to, so I guess the parents' job is also not to let the kid go too crazy. So, but but the idea is to say, well, I don't think it's a good idea, but I respect your choice. And that's what and that's empowerment. And that's what my parents did for me. And that's what God does for us every single day. All right. So think of it that way. He's and it's and 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 that takes a tremendous amount of trust. You know, giving giving someone free choice, giving your kid the keys to your car, 
right? That's a big act of trust. And God gives us the keys to his car because he gives us the keys to his car. We could make up, we could crash this place up. Some, some of us, sometimes we do. But God, every morning, still gives us the keys. And that's why a very interesting um, interpretation of the Moda Ani, the morning, the morning prayer, where we thank God when we're still in bed, we thank God for giving us a light life is a very interesting um prayer because the final two words is vague. We say Rabba Emunatecha. Now, Rabba Emunatecha, Rabba means a lot, great. Emunatecha is a very tricky word because the grammar there is totally messed up. It could basically mean it means belief. But it, the simple interpretation is our belief in Hashem is great. That's that, that that's that's I wonder what the Siddur translates. I'll take a look in a second. But the deeper interpretation is your belief is great. Hashem's faith in us is great. The fact that Hashem gives us life, gives us the keys to his to his Bentley, we could smash that thing up. And he gives us faith, he gives us space, he gives us room to make a mistake. That's holding back his presence. I'm just curious. I'm going to check right now what the Siddur translates. If it's our faith in God or God's faith in us, both are true. So both are right. But it's, I'm just still curious. Give me just one second. I'm sorry. Okay. What do we have here? We have page page two of the prayer book, page five of the prayer book. I offer thanks to you, living and eternal God, for you have mercifully restored my soul within me. Your faithfulness is great. They're translating it, not our faith in God, but God's faith in us. God gives me back my soul. He's giving me space. He's respecting me. He has faith in me. But faith in me means he allows me to make a decision. Because if he wouldn't have faith in me, he wouldn't create a human being. He would create a robot. And the robot makes no mistakes for the most part. Sometimes they make mistakes, but for the most part, they don't. So that's the that's that's the story. This is big stuff. Okay, so that's the Shema. Now we have to get to what the what the what 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 Torah study does because remember Torah study is a different mitzvah, but it's rooted in the same verses. So in a way, it's the same theme. In a way, it's a different theme. So we have to get to that. What is Torah study? Torah study. We're going to say, if the Shema is understanding that the entire universe. Is, an, is is united and one with Hashem, in other words, and therefore we have to incorporate and we have to um, respect the differences, which the whole idea is that all the various differences and the dichotomy within creation is united with the one God. In other words, in other words, it's bringing God into the universe or raising the universe to God. Torah study is going above the universe. Torah study, the universe doesn't matter. Torah study is you want to get into Hashem's head. You want to come into a place that's beyond the universe. It doesn't really make a difference. In other words, when you study Torah, the idea is not only to try to figure out how to elevate the world. That's Shema. Torah study is I want to unite with Hashem's wisdom. And Hashem's wisdom is above the world. And therefore, the differences don't matter. And therefore, the study, the study, the mitzvah to study Torah, the ability to connect to Hashem, which transcends the differences of the universe, that's one and ongoing because it doesn't really matter what state you are in. You could be in a happy state or a sad state. When you study Torah, it's not that when you, in other words, another way of putting it, when I say the Shema, I say, I feel that God is with me when I'm happy. That's morning. I feel that God is with me when I'm in pain. That's the night. Fine. Beautiful. Torah study is regardless if I'm happy or I'm in pain, I could connect to God. I can get involved in this idea. I could connect to God's wisdom and I forget about myself and my pain and my joy is irrelevant because now I'm looking at God's perspective. When I come back, I may start hurting again. That's the Shema. But the idea is whenever, wherever and whenever you are, you have the ability to transcend the universe and connect to Hashem. That's Torah. And that's why Torah is not in the business of saying, study Torah five minutes in the day, five minutes at night, at your lunch break. It doesn't matter. There's one ongoing mitzvah. Whenever you are, wherever you are, it doesn't matter. You could transcend. And in a way, so that's 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 a big, we have, we can, we, can, we, have, we have to we have to take this apart. But just to, just to get to the full picture, and then we could t take it apart either now or next year. The idea is, in a way, without the Torah, you can't have the Shema. They're anchored together. Because... The fact that I could put myself above the world, that allows me to understand that no matter where I am, I could connect to Hashem in my state of darkness because, because I'm anchored in the transcendence. Because I'm anchored in the transcendent, that's why I could feel Hashem also, I could believe in Hashem also when I'm in the state of darkness. 
So we'll have to read this and, and elaborate upon it. And maybe we'll read some inside to help clarify. But in, by this, but this is an interesting idea because what we're saying is you have two separate concepts. One separate concept is God is with me no matter how I feel. Beautiful, inspiring. Separate concepts, separate but related. I have the ability to study Torah to the point where I connect to God and, and, and connect to God's transcendence to the point where all the universe with its, with, its, with its problems don't really matter because I'm above all of this. I'm above all of this. Now, the goal is not to stay above. The goal is to get to the Shema. The goal is to incorporate everything within the oneness of Hashem. But to be able to bring Hashem into the world, you have to be anchored in a place where you are above the situation, right? If you're in a problem, it's much harder to solve it. If you're above it and you step in, but you're anchored sort of one foot above, one foot within, that's the that that's the that's the ideal model. So when we study Torah, we're above the problems of the world. When we say Shema, we incorporate Hashem within every aspect of creation. But that's the idea. When you study, when you study Torah, when you study anything, you just in a way you're studying and you forget about the world. It doesn't really matter. It's raining outside, it's not raining outside, it doesn't matter. You're studying mathematics, you're studying philosophy, you're studying Torah. Any, any, any wisdom is transcendent, but especially divine wisdom, because you're trying to connect to the essence of Hashem, which is transcendent. So there's the fact that Hashem is transcendent, and then there's the fact where, can I feel that transcendence within the universe? Oh, that's Shema. Two separate mitzvot, both important, both critical, both interdependent, because if you have just the transcendence, you miss the point. But if you don't have any transcendence, the darkness of the night may pull you down, and you won't be able to feel the oneness of Hashem. Only when you have the ability to forget about yourself, then could you come back and feel Hashem both in the good times and in the happy times. That's the big idea. A lot more to elaborate. Go ahead, Dr. Bob, please. So where does prayer fit in this duopoly of, uh, of studying Torah and, and Shema? I mean, uh, do, so in do a we, way, uh, prayer, I would say in a way, prayer is closer to Shema because prayer is about is subjective. Pray, prayer is about how I feel. The whole idea of prayer is to connect to, first of all, to ask Hashem for what I need, right? So prayer is much more a person speaking to God. Torah is God speaking to you. Prayer is your speaking to God. So when you speak to God, you matter. And if I'm hungry, that matters. But if God is speaking to me, the Ten Commandments, God is speaking to me, the proper state of mind is not to say, what am I having for lunch? The proper state of mind is to say, wow, I have an opportunity to get a vision and see the universe from the eyes of God, right? Imagine I could, you know, today to be a billionaire, you're not really a billionaire unless you fly to space. What is a billionaire that didn't go to space, right? So if you have an opportunity to transcend, to get onto the, to, to, to Musk's, uh, whatever they call those, and fly into space. So really, you're going to fly up to space, you're going to see the beautiful universe, and you're going to say, oh, I forgot my lunchbox. My friend, your lunch doesn't matter. You now have an opportunity to see a vision that far is as far beyond anything anyone could imagine. You could see the entire globe in, in, in the size of a ball. In other words, you can go beyond everything. So that's that's study Torah. You can look at the universe from the uh, from the eyes of Hashem. You, I don't really matter much. I forgot my lunchbox. It doesn't really matter. On the other hand, what's prayer? Prayer is how does it make me feel? Subjective. What do I need? What do I want? Can I feel Hashem when I'm in pain? Can I feel Hashem in my moments of joy? In a way, that's more important because it's easy to get, relatively easy, if you have a billion dollars. Torah is, is our ability to get that billion dollar ride. But it's easy, it's relatively easy to get onto a spaceship and go to space and see the universe. When you come back and you have to wait in, wait, wait in traffic on 42nd Street when it's hot and, and the train is late and there to be inspired, that's much harder, right? So the Torah is taking the space shuttle. Torah is you're getting the vision of the whole universe, beautiful. I, I'm hungry. Who cares about me? Don't waste your don't waste your trip to space thinking about yourself. On the other hand, you also have to have the ability to feel connected and feel inspired and feel happy and understand your own feelings. That's prayer. So I would think because, that prayer is much more like Shema. Because I would have thought, and I understand it better now, that in the day in the life of Rabbi Feldman, let's say you you taught classes and you're, in the afternoon, your wife went into labor and delivered your sixth kid, and you only had, you know, um, 45 minutes at the end of the day, either to do Minchan Mariv or to study Torah. Nice. I would have thought Torah study was more important. But now you're telling me 
you're going to make Menchamariv and then go back to the hospital and, so, and so, visit so where you went. It is a very interesting discussion because the Talmud debates this. What is more, if someone's studying Torah, should they stop studying Torah to pray? And the short answer is that most people should stop studying Torah to pray. But the people who study Torah all the time should not. In other words, not, not, I don't mean today, people study nine hours a day. Like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who never stopped studying Torah, he should stop. And the point is, we're at the end of the day, we're not, at the end of the day, we're much more subjective. It's much more important for us, for our spiritual makeup, to feel connected to Hashem subjectively. If someone is really in the realm of transcendence, if they're, if they're the pilot, if someone's the pilot of the space shuttle, they always transcend. For them, they could study Torah. But you see what I'm saying? I only take the space shuttle occasionally. So therefore, saying the Shema and connecting the divine presence to my subjective experience is more important for me. Occasionally, I study Torah. Now, I want to say that this, what, what I'm saying now is, 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 is has ramifications. For example, when it comes to doing a mitzvah, when it comes to, to, to doing a mitzvah, there's a lot of regulation. You want to bring an offering in the temple? Okay, so you have to be ritually pure. That usually takes seven days. Then you have to get the blood of the red, the ashes of the red heifer sprinkled upon you. Then you have to go to Jerusalem. Then you have to fill all the regulation and do every law to the extent. And if everything was done perfectly, and there's so many laws and details that can go wrong, if everything did, if everything went perfectly, okay, now you brought your 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 offering, and now you're you're atoned for. Says the Talmud, anyone who studies Torah, if you study the Torah, the laws of the Karbanot, the laws of the, the laws of the offerings, and we study it in our in, our, in the prayer, we read that we read the offerings in our prayer. That's study Torah study. You're it's like you brought the mitzvah. It's like you brought the offering. You could be outside of Israel, which you're not allowed to bring an offering outside of outside the temple. You could be outside the temple. You could be outside of Israel. You could be outside. You could be at night. You cannot bring any offerings at night. Right? It doesn't matter where you are. You study the laws of offerings. It's just like you brought the offering. How is that even possible? Because Torah is transcendent. Torah transcends the differences of time and space. You go beyond time and space. So if you're outside of time and space, you could bring that offering without being in time and space. Because that's Torah, the ability to transcend. But, the, but, the, but on the other hand, the mitzvah is like Shema. The mitzvah is, could you bring that experience within time and space? Ah, then you need regulation. Then not always could you be inspired. Not always could you accomplish this in the right way, right? If if if, if someone's in a bad mood, you can't, you know, if someone's mourning, you can't come and dance with them. The, you have to take everyone's, uh, uh, um, you, have to, you have to take the the the, the divisions of of, of of life and the dichotomy of life into, 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 into perspective. But when it comes to, but the ability to transcend still is still there. I could transcend. I can go beyond time and space. I could bring an offering right now. All I have to do is read the, study the Torah, the laws of offerings. I'm going beyond the differences, right? I think the first time when there was an astronaut, I forget who it was, who uh, turned back and saw the world suspended, the globe, the earth suspended in midair, he realized and said something to the effect, ah, so he realized that we are all interconnected. And he said something to the effect that uh, we're all in this together. And the wars and the divisions and all the things that the concern people, when you're looking at it from the outside, all that loses significance. The difference between borders and this is your country and this is my country. When you're outside of the world, all that loses all, all that loses significance. It doesn't really matter if you're in the Jerusalem, you're not in Jerusalem, you're above, you transcend. On the other hand, you have to bring it back into life. So that's, I, if I were to divide all of this, I would basically say Shema is bringing it into the reality. That's like the mitzvah where mitzvah is always regulated. You want to put on the, the mezuzah, this is exactly how it has to be done. You want to bring an offering, this is exactly how it wants to be done. You want to eat matzah, this is the minimum amount. And this is the exact time it has to be done, right? So mitzvah and shema is about bringing the oneness of Hashem into reality. So mitzvah, shema, and prayer are all subjective, all bringing it into reality. Whereas Torah study is the ability to go out of the universe and see the universe from the eyes of Hashem. And at that point, the differences in light and day are not are, lose significance. And therefore the mitzvah is ongoing. And therefore, um, because it doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really, it doesn't, it doesn't register the differences between night and day don't register. And also the regulation falls away, falls away. You can achieve much more and at any time because we're above time and space. So these are these are big ideas. A lot more to say, but uh, but just ju that's just that's just touching upon it. Go ahead, Vicky, please. Oh, 
Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, throughout our the whole discussion, because we were trying to separate Shema from Torah study, what the differences are, um, and also at the beginning you mentioned that Shema is meditation and you can achieve it by meditating longer but you can also because meditation is concentration you can yeah. achieve quicker if you understand and you have that idea in your mind constantly so my question to you is can we actually merge the two and and just say that because the shema is in the torah right so when you study torah it kind of helps you to understand the shema better and get to that idea get to that uh, the concent concentrate on that idea quicker so they are different and in a way yes I, I, of course the torah will bring you above uh, the understanding so can we study shema like we study torah because yeah, it, yeah you yeah. have to you have to be able that's the idea you have to be anchored in the transcendence to be able to feel God even in the darkness. That's ultimately, we didn't get to, we, we didn't fully spell that out. Maybe next week we should actually continue this essay and read it inside. These are, these are fundamental points, but in some way, we'll see. We'll see what we'll do next week. But the point is, yes, in some ways, how do I feel God in the darkness? It's a very hard thing to do. It's very easy to talk about it, very hard to do. When I don't feel the closeness of Hashem, I feel pain, I feel suffering, I feel confusion. How do I feel God? How is it possible that me, the subjective human being, was I'm only I'm only human, and I, I and and how do I how do I feel comforted that God is with me in the midst of pain? It's a very difficult thing to do. I don't. You ask me, could I do this? I have no idea. Only somebody who suffers could could tell you if they feel God when they walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Thank God I was not tested. I don't know, right? But how do I feel? How? Do, but if I could achieve this. I know people that did. My great uncle survived the Holocaust, still believed in God. How could you do that? How could you, how could you, how could you sense God in the darkness? It's 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 a very difficult thing. So what we're saying is if you have the ability to transcend, then when you come back, you're affect, you're still affected by that transcendence. So at some point you have to be anchored in Torah to be able to say the Shema properly. And vice versa. If you just if you're just transcendent, then it's very easy to believe in God by negating how you feel and say, I don't care about myself. The doctor Tamron will tell you that's not healthy, right? Because even when you transcend, you have to come back and say, but how does this feel to me subjectively? And therefore, they're both anchored in each other. They both need each other, but they're both different. And therefore, they both come from the same verse. It's this is profound. They come from the same verse, right? Deep stuff. This is deep stuff, my friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. This has been a great, a great experience, great opportunity for me. Always, always, always a transcendent experience with you, Rabbi. Okay. It's it's hard to come back to earth, Rabbi. That's the I, whole point. Now you got to say the Shema. You're studying Torah. Oh, case in point. You see now, case in there point. There you go. We went study Torah. You Listen, if you would take the trip, if you take Musk's trip to space, it's also hard to come back to earth, but it's still important because your wife and kids are waiting for you. No, so don't get lost in space. Might be an interesting point, Rabbi. Should we say the Shema after we study with you every time? You say this maybe before, maybe before, because the morning, yeah, yeah, maybe we should do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a mitzvah. Look, it's one of the most important mitzvot that don't take a lot of time and don't take a lot of investment. Even putting on tefillin, okay, you got to go get your tefillin. But Shema in the morning and Shema at night, it's literally a sentence. If you want to be extra careful, you could say the first, first, full par full, first paragraph, but some people say the first sentence is already the mitzvah. So if you want to incorporate a mitzvah in your life, and you should, and I encourage you to you, you to continue and co continuously incorporate more mitzvot, more opportunities for growth, I would say the Shema is the best, best and e most, you get the most bang for your buck. It's a critically important mitzvah, and it's so easy in, in, in time and investment. Rabbi? To incorporate, to think about it is a little harder, but to say the mitzvah, to do the mitzvah, it's the best bang for your buck. Go ahead, doctor. Years ago when I was in Turkey, and there was a lot of violence going on there and danger against the Jews. And I wanted to go to the synagogue. Yeah. The the person who was standing in front said to me, say the Shema. <laughs> and when I said it, he said, okay, now you can you're in, you're in, you're a Jew. Scary stuff. This year, October 7th, I forget which kibbutz, that there were people in the kibbutz that would not open the door to the soldiers. Finally, after 12 hours, when the soldiers came to rescue them because they thought they were Arab terrorists. And the soldiers said the Shema, and then the 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 people opened up the 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 doors. Wow, this is frightening stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I shall miss you all for the next two. Speaking of time travel, uh, the yeah, yeah, coming back take... to Earth. 
Yeah, exactly. We're going to be taking a family trip, so I shall miss you for the next 